For many years, the player base requested a new game mode to keep themselves busy, because in all fairness, both prize fights and rift battles can get outrageously repetitive. Resources are always scarce and desirable, and as mentioned several times before, PvP is generally a wasteland with literally nothing of value. Hidden Variable must have felt generous that afternoon after hearing the 178th complaint about the lack of a new game mode. All you ever do is complain! And soon enough, they got to work on it. The end result? And ultimately all right, but just kind of their mode, if that definition makes any sense. Of course, I'm talking about Parallel Realms. So that description for Parallel Realms I stated earlier may have confused some people. How come this new and exciting game mode ended up being rather tame and not as intense as the likes of Rift Battle? Well, two reasons. For one, I'm fairly acquainted with the game by this point. Obviously, me and many other veterans wouldn't really struggle with it. Second, this is essentially Dailies 2.0. By technicality, it's restricted to just one playthrough every three days. So you can't call them dailies per se, but at its core, it is a new and improved version of dailies. You go through a series of nodes to ultimately get a fat profit as a reward, and you do it twice, occasionally thrice a week. So yeah, if you ask me, the dailies comparison is fairly accurate, but does it manage to be more or less of a pain in the ass? Parallel Realms takes inspiration from the roguelike genre, or dungeon crawler, mystery dungeon, whatever the fuck it's called. Look, every stage and fight are randomized, and you collect a bunch of shit to upgrade your stats. It's a simple structure, and was easily implemented into Skullgirls through two particular factors. The fights themselves are completely random, which is no big deal, to a certain extent it's the same as in prize fights and rifts. The second and most relevant come in the form of artifacts. I'll discuss them later, but all you need to know for now is that they're modifiers for you, player aim catalysts if you will. The first thing that's openly noticeable is the fact that there's a total of 6 difficulties instead of the usual 4. There's a regular basic all the way to master, as well as nightmare, and the one you're most likely going to do every run with, no mercy. No, don't worry, it's not as hardcore as it initially sounds. I wouldn't deem it as necessarily easy, but it's definitely doable. Keep in mind, this mod is supposed to be cleared once every 3 days. The most apparent difference between difficulties is within the fighter scores, in which variant tiers are used. Basic sticks to bronzes, advanced with silvers, expert with golds, and master onwards with diamonds. But it's with master where set differences start to increase further. For the first time in the game, randomly generated defenders will start spawning with marquees and prestiges unlocked and both of their levels depend on the difficulty, obviously maxed at no mercy. It's also pretty apparent that they were testing the waters with mark implementation, and some cases end up hitting the target, while others lose defensive worth. The last differences are the total amount of base modifiers on each node and the total amount of rewards. No mercy naturally hosting the highest total of goodies in XP treats, coins, shards and relics. Ok, no more beating around the bush, we're diving deeper into the mode itself and we'll stick with No Mercy for most of the discussion, with the occasional lower difficulty mentions sprinkled in. Your average run of Parallel Realms will have you go through a total of 3 separate floors, each one finishing with a boss. It may not seem immediately apparent at first, but this time around you can use your variants as many times as you wish, no more energy bullshit to stall around with, except it comes with a crucial caveat your team's health will remain with the same percentage that you finish a fight with. Just like going from Battle Network 1 to Battle Network 2. Much like in Rifts, finishing a fight with as much health as possible is highly relevant. If your variant dies and is left for dead once the combat ends, then it becomes unusable for the rest of the run. Also, it goes without saying, but both a timeout and quitting the match result in all of your team rendered dead. Additionally, if you manage to cause some damage to the opposing team but still ended up losing somehow, the damage you've caused will remain, allowing you to start where you left off. I guess that means it's closer to Battle Network 5 in that regard. Not all is doom and gloom though. Alongside the regular nodes, you have recovery and resurrection ones. Recovery heals all your living variants by 50% each, while resurrection picks a random perished variant and revives it with 50% health. 
in case nobody is dead but you have damaged variants, one will be picked at random and recovered. And for both cases, if everyone is alive and at full health, these nodes work as a free pass. You will miss some rewards by using them, so choose wisely if you feel the need for the services. Keeping in mind these resurrection nodes and the fact that you have to keep your variants alive by the end of the fight, No Mercy keeps one nasty trick up its sleeve. On every single node of realms, there's a trifecta of commonplace modifiers for the opponents, the most relevant being better than dead. Oh, you stupid son of a if you lose a variant in combat, it's permanently killed and will only be able to be revived through the resurrection nodes, if luck is on your side that is. The other two modifiers don't make matters easier, being both immunotherapy and concrete resolve, both of which focus on heavy immunity presence. It goes without saying that the devs did their best to prevent the infamous ringlet spike abuse, since without the immunity, it would allow a simple bronze filia to take down the vast majority of realms on her own, as if it were prize fights basically. That being said, for a bit of criticism, they overdid it. There's barely any strategy involving debuffs that works in this mode because of the omnipresence of these two. I get that they didn't want to make it too easy, but they crippled a lot of strategies in the process. In other words, uh... Remove obnoxious immunity please, and thanks. Meanwhile, within each floor, there's a boss node to cap off its respective set, and these also feature a new modifier called Blood Armor. The effect is essentially Scared Stiff's damage limiter ability, meaning that multi-hit moves or characters are a requirement if you wish to finish in time. Strategies that involve Miasma and Drain abilities can also help. Fun fact, this effect is bugged. Yeah, the fact that it's Scared Stiff's ability the comparison is a bit too literal, and Precision bypasses it. Obviously, it's bound to be fixed, so don't grow fondly of it. Every floor features all of these, but each one has their share of individual modifiers. Starting with, what else, the first floor, we have Reactive Armor and Halftime. Two modifiers that aren't difficult to ignore with the right equipment, but can stall you out a few seconds. It's all just a matter of brute force. Boss notes, on the other hand, are generally more bothersome, in this case featuring Standing Tall as a much more constant regeneration source, and especially Possession Change, which can revive fallen opponents if you happen to defeat one next to their corpse. Not to mention, everyone gets a quick instant revival and 100% of blockbuster meter if they suffer a fatal hit. In other words, you either mind where you execute them, or resort to permakill options of your choice. Arguably the first floor's boss, is considered the most obnoxious due to how much time it can waste. The second floor doesn't stall out as much, rather it urges you to hurry up. Regular nodes feature Danger Zone and House Advantage, gradually building up pressure as the match progresses, but it's usually far more manageable. As for the boss, it's a collection of every elemental prize fight modifier at once. Water variants get to stall out for a few extra seconds, fire can fuck your shit up if you're not paying attention, air will force you to limit your blockbuster usage, Light is easily the hardest to deal with due to the constant final stand on flinching and invincibility, so removals are advisable, and dark trails close by, for it forces immediate action or you pay the price with an instant death. The third floor can be quite nasty if you allow it to do so, featuring Devil's Snare and Final Curse. It amps up the fight or flight element with thorns, and three approaches can be taken, constant interceptions, buff removals, or deadeye. As for Final Curse, it should be as easy as carrying immunity into the fight, that is, unless you're willing to take the debuff gamble. As for the boss, it's definitely challenging. We have time dilation as means of shortening the player's buff length, barbed wire serving as additional chip damage and being particularly hazardous when confronting Assassin's Creed. And last, Exquisite Corpse. It follows the same rules as Possession Change where you want to stay away from dead bodies, but now that applies through the entire fight. Failure to do so grants long-lasting thorns to the opponent. And also remember that should the AI use a tier 3 blockbuster, that will revive all of their teammates with 50% health, so pay careful attention to prevent that from happening. So far, the odds come across as fairly stacked in the favor of the AI, featuring both a large number of obnoxious modifiers and a gameplay mechanic designed specifically to force you to be conservative with your health, as well as to abuse recovery. Luckily for you, the player, the game throws you an almighty bone in the form of artifacts. Artifacts are, plain and simple, modifiers that affect your variants in different ways. Inherently positive, but there may be the occasional catch. You can only access them after finishing a fight, and the game will let you choose between two, both of which can be of either bronze, silver or gold rarities. 
After defeating a boss, you will be able to choose between three gold artifacts, as a reward of overcoming an allegedly difficult battle. They are overall a good addition, functioning as player-focused catalysts although its weakness tends to lie in being entirely randomized, and the choices being sometimes a pick between the lesser of two evils. But that's ultimately part of the challenge, pulling through with whatever hand the game deals. Isn't that just SGM in general? Now I'm not gonna review each and every artifact out there, like I'm not gonna explain the basics of a damage increase. But here's a few general comments. Currently, most of the debuff-oriented artifacts suffer from the constant immunity present, with a few exceptions. If that wasn't the case, some could rise to being good, while others would likely remain mediocre. As for my personal favorites, we can find the following cases. Jellyfish Lantern is a deceivingly strong artifact, despite being labeled as a bronze, providing a long-lasting 20 seconds immunity early on. It doesn't last for the whole match unless you use buff resetters like Shadow Puppet or Triple Threat, but it helps to fend off modifiers like Final Curse or Barbed Wire, as well as whatever the randomized variants may throw at you. Headlist is simple by design, but incredibly powerful, applying permanent death mark on the entire enemy team. You could say it's essentially a power boost in disguise, but its effects are immediately felt if you use a heavy crit variant. It's also an absolute field day for Dream Demon, so there's that. Its only downside has to be increasing reflect damage against pain wheels, but if you go critless it's not a big deal. Apple Juice is also pretty popular, serving as constant chip damage through Miasma. Having to resort to blockbusters and being tied to 50% odds slows it down, but it's still nice to have around. Not to mention, buff resetters, once again, may squish some extra utility out of it. Fishbone Cleaver is diet leech for the whole team. That's it. General recovery for everyone, and that's all the reason you need to get it. In a mode where health matters a lot, you obviously want to remain with as much health as possible. And Fishbone Cleaver can relieve a lot of stress. Just be careful not to get inflicted with inverse polarity. Flashbangs is a free shot on the first opponent, for it stuns them for 5 seconds and also deals some cheap damage. It's very simple and one use, there's not much more explanation than that. This can often turn the battle into a 3 vs 2, rather ridiculous for such a simple effect, and maybe a potential nerf target, who knows. Presence of Aeon Sexo is powerful indeed. It grants 2 evasion stacks, and as long as you have set buff active, you will gain constant mirror. Being able to ignore 2 free hits is relevant for survival, and as means of support for intercepting. It also matches greatly with Jellyfish Lantern, and to a lesser extent Fog Machine. Last, we have Gehina's Oblivion, a match-securing tool capable of instantly killing opponents through blockbusters, as long as they're under 15% health. It's usually at its most convenient against bosses, since you can only deal 5% damage per hit, and it's particularly helpful on floor 1, should you be lucky enough to get it early. It's not a top-tier artifact by any means, but it's convenient to have regardless. That pretty much covers all of the basics regarding Parallel Realms. If I were to describe it, it's a seemingly convoluted mode at first, but after a couple playthroughs it becomes straightforward. It has to if it wants to maintain a semi-daily status. It's fair to say that No Mercy and, to a lesser extent, Nightmare pose challenges to most of the lesser experienced player base, to which I can only say either you improve your current collection or the tried and true get good. But it would be harsh to just call it a day with such dog shit advice, wouldn't it? So here's a couple of tips and strats that may help you out. A pretty basic tactic you can do is to try and taking as many branching paths as possible. By this I mean that you should ideally favor nodes that once you're done with them, you get to choose which node to follow up with, instead of following up with a singular path that you have to take. It's minor, but being able to decide between one or the other could make it a little easier on your end. Of course, if you don't mind taking the risk or missing an artifact gain, then by all means you can take the singular route. Speaking of missing on artifacts, unless you're in a particular hurry, doing a speedrun or whatever else, I wouldn't advise for using recovery nodes of either kind. Instead, it's best to carry recovery heavy characters such as Philia, Fuqua or Umbrella, or variants like Bloody Valentine and Xbot. At most, I would say that the resurrection nodes could be used in case you lost a highly valuable variant and need to retrieve it back from the graveyard, but you must keep in mind you don't get to control what variant makes it back alive, so it's yet another gamble to take. As for actual gameplay strategy, I would prefer to keep it to a much more abstract degree, since despite the heavy usage of immunity, it's a mode that can imbibe a certain degree of experimentation and risk taking. If nothing else, people have already gone out of their way to do self-imposed challenge runs on the mode itself and it usually works. 
provided they have the budget to pull it off. Me personally, these tend to be my regular choices. Shadow Puppet as a remarkably strong sweeper and with the added benefit of resetting buff timers. Harlequin for some extra horsepower to special moves. Bloody Valentine as means of safe pain will disposal. And finally Windswept as the main precision user and bug abuser. Yeah, I'll be shameless about using her for the bosses. I don't care. I got away with day one on Holy Host. For the most part you could keep it as simple as using your strongest variants available and roll with it. The modifiers may get in your way on the occasion, but more often than not you'll be countering the variants themselves instead. And the vast majority are unsuited for defense anyway. So with that, I would say just find whatever suits you the most. Well, that's all she wrote. I don't think there's anything else that needs further explanation. As a whole, Parallel Realms is easy to pick up and play, as well as understanding its mechanics through actually playing the thing. You know, like the average video game. The odds of getting used to No Mercy may not be the highest if you're low skilled, but I promise after a couple of successful runs, you will get the hang of it. Still, it has a couple of misses and plenty of room for improvement in the future. Once again, bringing up the whole immunity spam shit, and maybe adding some sort of mini-boss in the middle for guaranteed silver artifacts could be nice. In conclusion, it's a welcome brand new game mode and I hope it has new additions for it in the future. With all that, thanks for watching and uh, I should start working on the damn Wipeout video. <laughs> Una concha, un buen culo, una puta.